Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our new online sphere that we've almost got down. Um, we're pretty much experts at it by this point. Um, we don't need to beat a dead horse of why we're here, um, COVID. Um, but we're so happy that you came online with us to, to listen to this message and this music and just to be a part of it. Um, what we'd like to, to remind you is that throughout this entire message, feel free to make any sort of comments or um, to submit any concerns you may have or prayer requests um, during the message. We have a lot, it's a live feed going on, so um, feel free to just let those flow in and we'll have people um, commenting back and, and reaching out to you um, in whatever way it fits. Um, and also, if you are new with us, if you are just joining for the very first time, um, or if you've just never signed up with us before, please go to our website, um, csfiupy.com. You will find a general form on the front page that just gives us a little bit of information about you, um, just gives us some, some ability to contact you um, and just reach out with you so we can connect with you even further. Um, just again, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for taking the time to um, listen to God's word and really pour your praise out to him. So um, let's get ready for tonight.
post basketball night. If you don't come to these, you should, even though we're only going to have one more in like three weeks. But this portion of uh, Night of Worship is a hype activity. Last time you saw me scream. This time I'm going to include some people. And we're going to have a pie eating contest just to celebrate Thanksgiving a little bit. So we have Alex, we have Sarah, the married duo here. And my wife's not here, but in spirit, this pie is for her. So we're going to see who can eat their miniature pie the fastest. So we need a countdown. Grant? Wait, are we going on go? Or Three. On go. Go on go. All right, ready? Three, two, one, go. Oh no! <laughs> crumble, crumble in the trash. It doesn't count. He just take it to his full mic. No, it was. Oh, that's not good. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> I think Ethan got one by this one. Oh, I think Ethan got it down. Can't pee. Got swallowed. It was full sip. Alex tapped out. Sarah and Ethan, come on. Oh, Sarah might be. Sarah. Come on, Sarah. Check them out. Check them out. We got a winner. You ready for the message? Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the message portion of this night of worship. Wow, we couldn't be more excited that you're taking time out of your busy week with finals quickly approaching. Some of you have finals. Uh, here in the next week, and then some of you go into December. It's just been kind of a wild whirlwind of a semester. We are so grateful you're here to lock in to one of these final night of worship messages in the ministry of a man named Elijah in the Old Testament. And we've already said this before, but uh, since March, all of our lives have kind of been in a whirlwind. So it's been neat to see uh, the life of a man who was also caught in a whirlwind of what God was doing in his life. We really just, tonight the passage is kind of a wild one, and we were talking earlier about how none of us have really heard a sermon on this passage, so I don't know if that's good news for you tonight or bad news, but uh, we believe that God really wants to say something to us really uh, special tonight, and if, if you can just lock into one thing as we head into our time together, I want you to hear this one thing, that when we release control, we receive hope. So let's step into the whirlwind of control tonight. And to start us off, Thomas Hess is going to give us a great introduction into our passage and share a little bit about what God's teaching him about truth. Hey everyone, and thanks for being here with us tonight. We're really excited as we start off 2 Kings. Um, my name is Thomas Hess and I'm a senior in the biomedical engineering department. Um, as we start 2 Kings, I want us to look at a verse at the very beginning of chapter 1 that will kind of direct where we go tonight. Um, 2 Kings 1, verse 3. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, Go up and meet the messenger of the king of Samaria and ask them, Is this because there is no God in Israel that you are going off to consult Baal, the god of Ekron? Therefore, this is what the Lord says, You will not leave the bed you are lying on. You will certainly die. So Elijah went. So one of the key things we have to look at is God gives Elijah this truth. He tells Elijah to go tell the king that he will die. Now imagine putting yourself in Elijah's shoes. Going and telling a king he will die is punishable by death. And that does not even include the torture and everything they will do to you beforehand. And so one of the things we have to consider as we go into the few following verses is how Elijah felt and imagine putting yourself in his shoes. Because as we see when we start in verse 7 through 9 here in a second, Elijah is not... His message is not perceived well by the king, and he's surely sending an army to come up and confront Elijah to take him back. And so we have to imagine ourselves in his position. How would we deal with the truth that God gives us when we're opposed? And whether this opposed is opposition or being opposed by others is a force, like we see here in the, in the verses we're going to go through. Is it an army that's opposing us? Or maybe in today's society, we're looking at someone that opposes us through Twitter. Are we looking at a cancel culture? Are we going to stay with the truth when cancel culture hits us? And so we see in James uh, chapter 4, verse 4, a key verse that we kind of have to keep in the back of our mind uh, when these thoughts of maybe changing our sides come. It says, Adulterous people 
Don't you know that friendship with the world means an enemy against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. And so we see in this, as these verses we're going through, that if Elijah changes his stances, his stance on this truth that God has given him, he becomes an enemy to God. Now that is so powerful because it's telling us that when we change what God says to make friend, friends of the world, we become an enemy to God. So we have to deal with this and think about this. How are we going to respond when someone opposes the truth of God? But we have to go even deeper and think, how are we going to deal when our own self opposes the truth of God? How are we going to act when we see someone that needs help on the side of the street? Are we going to go be Christ to them and spread the, spread, spread the truth? Or are we going to just keep driving by or keep walking by? Are we going to see someone who's hurting and needs, needs God in their life? Are we going to go do something with the truth? Or are we going to let our own self hold us back, oppose God, and be an enemy towards him? We have to deal with these truths every day. And we have to make sure we are not putting ourselves in that position. For me, one of the truths I'm dealing with is what is my role in the kingdom I feel a very strong calling to go help others, but every time I see the opportunity when I walk by, I'm putting myself in direct opposition to God and His will. And so I have, to, I have to come to the truth that by giving up my, my feelings, my emotions to God's truth gives me hope for the future. When I surrender to God and just buy into His truth that He's given us with the Bible, it gives me such a great hope and it gives us a, such a great hope for our future. 2 Kings 1, 7 through 9. What sort of man was he, the king demanded? What did he look like? They replied, he was a hairy man, and he wore a leather belt around his waist. Elijah from Tishbe, the king exclaimed. Then he sent an army captain with 50 soldiers to arrest him. They found him sitting on top of a hill. The captain said to him, man of God, the king has commanded you to come down with us. Thank you, Thomas, for sharing that amazing uh, testimony of what God has been teaching you recently. And thank you, Tiffany, for reading the first part of our scripture as we look at this king named Ahaziah. And we call this section, this first section, Son of an Ahab. <laughs> and Ahaziah sustained an injury. If, if we go back to last week and recap what we learned uh, last week in our study, uh, this week we see uh, that he's going to confront Elijah and they, they give this description of Elijah with the, the hairy garment. Uh, the Hebrew is p literally possessor of hair and the leather belt, and he knows exactly who this man is. He knows him because uh, he was familiar with his dad's life and his mom's life, and Elijah was a constant thorn in their sides, if you will remember from our previous study. And Elijah definitely isn't a vegan, <laughs> if you look at the scripture. Um, but this goes to show, I think, in our lives that our parents will put us either at an advantage or a disadvantage when it comes to our faith. And, and it doesn't mean that uh, because our parents lived a certain way that that means that we have to. There was actually a proverb that was floating around Israel uh, close to this time. Uh, it was recorded by Ezekiel that our, our parents ate sour grapes so our teeth are set on edge. But just because our parents have lived their lives a certain way doesn't mean that, that we will. We can still be about rewriting our own legacy. And unfortunately for Ahaziah, he has not rewritten his legacy. He has joined in and he's only going to have a two-year stint as king. And it's not going to be much different than how his parents lived. And this is an opportunity for us to look at this and and know that God can rewrite our legacy. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, we see he's not willing to release control. And that's that our one thing, once again, when we release control, we receive hope. That's funny, really. 2 Kings chapter 1, verses 10 through 14. Elijah, Elijah answered the captain, If I am a man of God, may fire come down from heaven and consume you and your fifty men. Then fire fell from heaven and consumed the captain and his men. 
At this, the king sent Elijah another captain with his 50 men. The captain said to him, Man of God, this is what the king says. Come down at once. If I am a man of God, Elijah replied, may fire come down from heaven, consume you and your 50 men. Then fire of God fell from heaven and consumed him and his 50 men. So the king sent a third captain with his 50 men. This third captain came up and fell on his knees before Elijah. Man of God, he begged, please have respect for my life and the lives of these 50 men, your servants. See, fire has fallen from heaven and consumed the first two captains and all of their men. But now have respect for my life. Thank you so much, Thomas, for reading that scripture for us in the second part of our passage tonight that we're going to be looking at. And uh, this section we're simply calling it a protective God, a protective God. And I think really what these verses are trying to communicate to us uh, tonight as we jump in and look at this is that Ahaziah is really trying to put pressure on Elijah to reverse the prophecy. And the prophecy, of course, was that he was going to die. And essentially, he's saying to Elijah, take it back, take it back. Um, and the plan is not for a peaceable arrest of Elijah. Uh, these soldiers were sent to Elijah to take him by force. Uh, it was not looking good for Elijah in the situation, so much so that we, we, we know that he was afraid and uh, they were about to take him forcibly and put the fear of Baal in him. And this is the king stepping into an even larger act of defiance against Yahweh, against Elijah, against everything that the Israelites had stood for. And Jay Robinson, he says it so powerfully when he says that the king already knows the will of the God of Israel, but he is refusing to heed it. Many have chosen to say that this section in 2 Kings is, was really not there originally, and this wasn't the actual account of what, what took place. Uh, because it's such a strange passage that 102 of these men were essentially uh, torched, uh, and it, it's very, very intense. But we believe uh, that, that this doesn't fit outside of what we see of God in other passages in the Bible we see Moses has some similar experiences, one in Leviticus chapter 10, verse 2, and Numbers chapter 11, verse 3, if you want to look those up. And I love what D.J. Wiseman says here. He says, here we see that God was protecting his servant, and he was protecting his word. And uh, so we know that, that God uh, really, before Jesus came, a lot of things happened like this, uh, maybe not exactly like this, but he, this is the, in a way in which he did move. Uh, but Jesus' disciples, so much so that when they found themselves uh, seeing these people who weren't willing to take care of them when they were coming into their city, they, they asked Jesus if, if uh, it was time to rain some fire down from heaven, maybe a repeat situation of Elijah and the soldiers. But Jesus, in Luke chapter 9, verses 54 and 50 through 56, he rebuked them by saying this, you don't realize what your hearts are like. See, Jesus is ushering in a new day, a new way. He says, for the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. You see, the big switch is happening here with Jesus ushering in this new day of saving men's lives. Yet, we do see other places in the New Testament like in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29, when it says our God is a consuming fire, Revelation 11, 5, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9, that there still is a terrible eternal fate for those who choose to reject Jesus or like Ahaziah have chosen to directly oppose or attack the name of Jesus. And so as long as there is still breath, though, we know this, that there is still hope for someone to be saved. And so even though this section of Scripture may be confusing, it may throw you for a loop when you first see it, you need to know how much Jesus loves you. Just like he said in Luke chapter 9, he is about saving lives. And I, I think we need to know that God is a protect, protective God. He protects his children, and he will protect us for all of eternity. And so, once again, when we release control, we receive 
hope. 2 Kings 1, 15 through 18. Then the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, Go down with him and don't be afraid of him. So Elijah got up and went with him to, to the king. And Elijah said to the king, This is what the Lord says. Why did you send messengers to Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, to ask whether you would, will recover? Is there no god in Israel to answer your question? Therefore, because you have done this, you will never leave the bed you are lying on. You will surely die. So Ahaziah died, just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. Since Ahaziah had, did not have a son to succeed him, his brother Joram became the next king. This took place in the second year of the reign of Jehoram, son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. The rest of the events in Ahaziah's reign and everything he did are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. Thank you, Tiffany, so much for reading the last part of our scripture that we're going to be studying tonight. Uh, the third set of soldiers uh, had a captain that immediately went into a plea for mercy. And uh, we call this, uh, the section last one, do not be afraid. And so they, they come with this plea for mercy. Uh, please, 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 please. We don't want to end up like the other, the 102 who lost their lives. Uh, and if the angel of the Lord doesn't intervene here, uh, their fate is going to be the same as the previous 102. But instead, their lives are saved. And this shows that there was a real threat on Elijah's life and that he was full of fear when these soldiers were coming. He was not sitting up there pretentious, uh, I've got everything in control. He was, he was feeling very, very fearful. Otherwise, the angel of the Lord would not have told him to not be afraid. Uh, Elijah, we know this from before with uh, Jezebel, he just didn't do well with death threats. I don't know who really does, but he didn't do well with de death threats. He was afraid. And so he was face to face. Finally, he went. Angel of the Lord says, hey, don't be afraid to go. He goes. He's now face to face with the king. Ahaziah is getting what he wants, but not really. He, he wants him to go ahead and reverse the prophecy so that he can live, so he can survive. And so the same questions. Why? And why did you go to Ekron? Why didn't you go to the God of Israel, Elijah says to Ahaziah. And I think this is really good for us to, to understand about God's characters, that God never does anything without just cause. He just doesn't go around uh, allowing people to die or uh, sending the fire down for no reason. Uh, even the most confusing commandments that we see in the Bible are actually full of rich purpose and meaning. And so the angel comes and he assures Elijah that he does not have to be afraid. He still needs reminding after all of this time of God working in and through Elijah, he still needs God to remind him that he does not need to be afraid, that he is with him no matter what. And I think all of us need that kind of reminding. When we get in times of, of fear and everything's out of control, we need to know that God loves us. And we don't have to be afraid that God can deliver us from those fears. When we release control, we receive hope. Hi, my name is Tiffany. I'm a freshman at IUPUI, and I don't really know what I'm going to major in yet. Um, it's so easy to see the shortcomings of the people in Bible times, like why did Adam and Eve have to go and eat that fruit? Or why the Israelites complain when they've literally just been rescued from slavery? Or why did Ahaziah think that he could control God's will when his parents had clearly just failed? It's so easy to judge them for, for these things, but the truth of the matter is that we still struggle with these things today. It's just hard to recognize them in ourselves. Sometimes it takes a humbling experience to realize that we, in fact, are not in control. Yes, I do know this from personal experience. I'm a perfectionist, so I think you guys can tell where this is going. I had this grand picture of what my life was supposed to look like. Hardship, parental divorce, failure, those were all things that happened to other people until it happened to me. And it all started to build up, overwhelming me. My mom has struggled with a mental illness for years. In fact, I don't even remember a time um, when it wasn't like that. Um, I believe it to be a parent, uh, the paranoid personality disorder. It causes her to push everyone who loves her away. 
It makes her fiercely protective of my little sister and aggressive toward everyone else. It not only deteriorated my parents' relationship, but also the relationship my brother and I had with our mom. My dad moved out last Easter, and as the oldest sibling, I put this immense responsibility on myself to be there for my parents and to be a good role model for my siblings, especially my little sister. This only led to my mom accusing me of trying to take over her role as a parent and saying that I always side with my dad. She packed up my stuff and told me to move out. I think the hardest part was her mood swings. One day she'd be mad at me and the next she'd pretend like nothing happened and tell me she loved me. She showed, up, she showed no remorse, only self-pity. I started stay, staying in my room at, a lot and spending a little, as little time with her as possible. And when my parents got divorced I, and I turned 18, I moved in with my dad full time. On top of all that, I learned I sucked at standardized tests and I also failed my driver's test. I just felt like an all around failure. I put this pressure on myself to fix everything, to be perfect at everything, only to find out that I couldn't do it all. I tried going to a couple of counselors and told some of my friends what was going on, but I felt like no one truly understood. I felt like I was struggling all alone. Then I came across the verse, 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10, which says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This was just what I needed to hear. It really changed my outlook on life. God showed me that if I relied on my own strength, I would fail. Being weak actually forces me to learn or to lean into God's strength. It was in the midst of all my failure and self-pity that I learned to trust in God alone. I don't have to be in control of my life because God is, and he has promised to work everything together for my good and his glory. So while things may still be hard, I'm not without hope. There is purpose for my pain. Tiffany, thank you so much for having the courage to share uh, your story and what God has been teaching you in the whirlwind of your life over the last year. Uh, we really, really appreciate you being vulnerable with us all. Uh, I just want to come out of your story and out of the passage that we just um, went through and just give us some things just to take with us for application. The very first thing I want us to take with us is that there uh, is hope for your legacy. There is hope for your legacy and and Tiffany, this speaks perfectly to what you were sharing about. But Acts chapter 2, verse 38, we see Peter giving command to be, repent and be baptized, every one of you. And then in, in verse 39, we see an interesting verse. He says, this promise, uh, the forgiveness of sins and the receiving of the Holy Spirit, is for you and your children and all who are far off. That's a legacy statement. Uh, when we do premarital counseling, with uh, young couples who are getting married, uh, we always ask them, was one of the questions we ask, uh, when it comes to your legacy of faith, when it comes to your family, are you creating a legacy of faith? Are you sustaining a legacy of faith? Or are you resurrecting um, a legacy of faith? I'd like to ask that question of you tonight. Uh, are you creating a legacy of faith? Uh, like, brand new or are you sustaining it like um, your family has done such a good job of teaching you about Jesus and showing you how to live the Christian life or maybe uh, you're resurrecting something that's happened at some point but has kind of fallen off in recent times it's good to think about that but the, whatever situation you're in tonight we want to we want to just remind you that there is hope for your legacy I think that encourages all of us to know that there's a hope for our legacy. There was even hope for Ahaziah before he made the decisions that he made. The second is that there is hope for their salvation. There is hope for their salvation. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 says this about God, that he desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Um, who in your life right now 
as a Christian, who in your life who is not a Christian, who have you just completely given up on because it seems like there's absolutely no hope of them being saved? Who in, and then on the other side of that, maybe someone that you've given up on, but who in your life right now is really open to the gospel, open to the message of Jesus that you have been unwilling to talk to you? I think both of those are people that we really need to pray for, especially that they would come to the knowledge of salvation in Jesus and come to a time of repentance and faith in Jesus. And I think the third thing in this passage is to know that there is hope for your fear. Uh, Mark chapter 5 verse 36 is a great example uh, that, that we don't have to be afraid. And Jesus, time and time again, is telling us, who we need to fear, and it isn't anything other than God. We don't need to fear men. We know that God is with us all the way. He's wanting to deliver us from fear in our lives. And the angel had to reassure Elijah that his life would be protected. So the big question tonight is, what right now is flooding your heart with fear? Entrust Jesus with that. Would you put it in his hands? Yeah, he's more than strong to carry those fears and to encourage you all the way to the end so that you can make it. When we release control, we receive hope. So how would our world be different if every single one of us released control to Jesus? What if we refused to tight fist areas in our lives that we really can't handle and we can't control anyway? I think that's usually what happens. Things that are out of our control, we're trying so hard to squeeze it and, and control it, and we can't. We can't. I think our entire lives would be transformed. I think hope would really start to take its root in us. We would wake up with a renewed sense of purpose each and every day. Even if the circumstances aren't going our way, even if our car breaks down, even if a relationship fails, even if a test came back uh, positive for COVID or whatever the case is, we would know that we have hope for living that day, no matter what the circumstances is, uh, are. And we would also realize that this life isn't about us. This life is about God. A time in my life when this was really, really relevant for me was when I was in college and I had the girl that I wanted to marry and she was the one that I wanted to be with for the rest of my life and her name was Samantha. And uh, so yeah, I did what any guy would do in that situation. I asked her out and she said no. And uh, I asked her out again and she said no. And this is over a period of two and a half years. <laughs> and I had reached the point of almost embarrassment. And so finally I was like, you know what? This isn't gonna happen. Uh, you know, I, I'm just gonna give up. And now about a halfway through that point, uh, she had written me a, a card for my birthday. And in that card, she had told me that she loved me. And I actually never opened that card. I, I never did. And we never spoke of it until later on after, uh, later on in, in life. And uh, that card, in that card, she told me she loved me. And it wasn't until after we had been married. Yes, we got married later on. Uh, that I'd opened that card and realized that what would have happened if I would have had that sense of hope in my waiting? Would I have been as impatient? Uh, would I have had a better perspective uh, on that situation? Here I was trying to control it, but if I had that little glimpse of hope, I think I would have been able to make it, maybe, and maybe would have dated a lot sooner than we actually did, which we ended up dating my senior year. And so what about you? I, uh, will you be willing tonight to release control in order to receive hope? We pray that you will. And one of those ways, that the, the most important way that you can release control to God tonight is to accept uh, his son, Jesus, and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. To make that decision to go all in to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, to commit your entire life to following him. We got a great page on our website, csfiupui.com slash baptism. Check that page out. We would love to engage with you more. There's a form on there you can fill out. We would love to connect with you about that if you haven't made that decision. 
So as we head into the end of this semester, for some of you, you're finishing a lot of your classes here in the next week. Uh, some of you have to go a little bit longer, but wherever you're at, uh, we pray that you would finish strong to the end. You would release all that control to Jesus, all these things that are too heavy to carry, too heavy to bear, and you would allow him to help you in a way that no one else can. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this time we can spend together. We pray that you would just please carry us to the finish line. Uh, please show us that there's reason uh, for getting up in the morning, uh, getting ready, uh, getting on a Zoom call, going to class, going to work, uh, communicating with family, whatever it is, God, I pray that we would realize that there's, there's so much to live for because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. We thank you for this story of Elijah and Ahaziah. And though it's kind of sad in a lot of ways, it really is sobering and it wakes us up and helps us to realize that we need you. We need you more than anyone else, anything else. We need you, God. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.